Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. In today's video, I'm gonna be wrapping up all the reading that I did in the month of September. It is October 1st, which means not only are we headed straight into spooky season and fall, but also that we need to talk about the reading I did in September. I'm gonna tell you up front, September was a little bit of a mixed bag for me. I read fewer books than I have in other months of the year. I still read quite a lot, but a little bit less than previous months. Part of this might have been that, as you'll see, I was reading more science fiction, fantasy, and horror, and less romance, which I think I get through romance much faster. But reading a little bit less and having more of a mixed bag in terms of rating and how much I was liking the books that I was reading. If you are new to my end of month wrap ups, the way that these work is I start by talking about all of my stats for the month. I am a nerdy person who loves to do my stats. I know some of you guys like them as well. But if that is not something you are particularly interested in, you are welcome to skip ahead to where I start actually reviewing the books. However, we are going to start with my statistics and then talk about all the books that I read in September, beginning with my DNFs or books that I did not finish, then my lowest rated books, moving up to my highest rated books so that we end on a on a high note. I, I like doing it that way. Let's go ahead and dive into the stats. In the month of September, I read 30 books for a total of 10,732 pages, and that works out to approximately 345 pages per day on average. For comparison, this is about 1,500 pages fewer than what I read in August. So I definitely read a little bit less than I had been in previous months. The number of books I read in August was 36, but I was also reading shorter books, and I had quite a few tomes on my TBR for September. This month I only DNF'd one book, although given my star ratings, maybe I should have DNF'd more of them. <laughs> it's a possibility. Three of the books that I read were by indie authors. Three of the books that I read were rereads, which is high for me and that was a lot of fun. 19 of the books that I read were either advanced reader copies or ARCs or books that were sent to me for review. That number is higher than usual. It's typically around 50% of my reading and this month it was definitely more. I was working really hard to get to all of those books that I was supposed to be reviewing. This month I did not read any translated works or any graphic novels. I did however listen to quite a lot of audiobooks. In fact, 17 of the books that I read were audiobooks audiobooks. I also read 10 physical books and three ebooks. Six of those audiobooks are what I call shelf, which means I had a physical copy on my TBR shelf and I got it off via audio. And in terms of where those audiobooks were coming from, two of them were from Audible, three of them were from my library, one of them was from Scribd, one of them was an audio influencer copy from Libro FM. If you want to check out Libro FM, they're a great service for audiobook listeners that is linked down below, and some of their proceeds go to support indie bookstores. A whopping seven of them were audio arcs from NetGalley. I had a lot of audiobooks for review. I've also been loving the fact that NetGalley is having more available. That has been fantastic. And two of them were audio review copies from the Penguin Random House Volumes app. So uh, a lot of my audiobooks were things for review. Oh, one other thing, this is not actually going to be on the graphic that you see next to me, but I did listen to one book from Author Direct. This is an app where authors can send you a code to download their audiobook for review. Um, that's not something I use frequently enough that it's on this list, but I did have one audiobook that I listened to that way this month. Moving on, let's look at the age categories of the books that I was reading. In September, 22 of the books that I read were targeted at an adult audience. This was by far the majority of my reading. Seven of them were targeted at a YA audience, and one of them was targeted at a middle grade audience. This is not terribly surprising. It's definitely consistent with the direction that my reading has been taking this entire year. Next, let's look at publication date. In September, the earliest published work I read was from 1954. That would definitely be Fellowship of the Ring by J.R.R. Tolkien. In total, I read nine books that were published prior to 2020, one book published in 2020, and 20 books published in 2021. Then looking at author demographics, we're doing pretty well here. In September, 43% of the books that I read were written by Black, Indigenous, or person of color authors. I'm trying to hit around 50%, but 43 is 
fairly good, especially considering that I read so many last month. And then 27% of the books that I read this month were written by queer authors. Okay, so genre is a little unusual for me. I told you I wasn't reading as much romance as usual, and you will definitely be able to see that. Romance is usually my most read genre or sometimes my second most read genre, but in September it was my third most read genre. I know. 11 of the books that I read were fantasy, eight of them were sci-fi, and only five were romance. Two of those were contemporary romances and three of them were speculative romances. That's your sci-fi, fantasy, paranormal. I also read five horror novels and one literary fiction. Next let's look at the star ratings. This month I did not give any books one star or one and a half stars, but I gave three books two stars and one book two and a half stars. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, more than usual for me, I definitely had some books I wasn't wasn't loving this month. I gave one book three stars, two books got three and a half stars, nine books got four stars, four books got four and a half stars, eight books got five stars, and two books got six stars. And in my personal rating scale, a six star read is a favorite of the year. So I had two of those in September. Lastly, let's look at my 2021 reading challenge thing that I set for myself. I've made some progress we're just gonna pretend that the series thing never happened and maybe I will not do it <laughs> next year. Um, that said, I have now read six of the eight classics on my yearly TBR, seven of the nine SFF books, and still just four of the 14 series completion books. So it's fine. It's all fine. That is it for statistics. Let's move on to talking about all of the books that I read. For some of these books, I talked about them in more detail in my mid-month wrap-up for the books that I read in the first part of the month. So for those books, I'm just going to tell you what it is and my star rating. If you want to hear more detailed thoughts on any of them, I'm going to direct you to my mid-month wrap-up, which I will link up above. Beginning with my DNFs, or books that I did not finish, I had one this month, and again, I did talk about it in my mid-month wrap-up. This book was The Godstone by Violette Milan. If you want to hear about that, check out my mid-month wrap-up. Next I had three books that got two stars, definitely higher than usual for me, and I didn't talk about any of them in my mid-month wrap-up, so these were all in the latter portion of the month, and uh, it, honestly kind of a bummer. Okay, so for the first book that I gave two stars to, I'm so sorry V, I feel really bad because I know you wanted me to read this, it just like didn't really work for me. This is Look the Part by Jewel E. Ann. And you know, your mileage on this is really going to vary. I've seen a lot of rave reviews of this book, so clearly it's working for some people. Unfortunately, it had several things that are like kind of pet peeves of mine with romance that just made it not not be quite my cup of tea. One thing about this is that it kind of presents itself as this lighthearted rom-com between this like buttoned up lawyer who's a single dad with an autistic son and this woman who's kind of this bubbly carefree music therapist, okay? And uh, it's it's really not lighthearted at all. This is <laughs> like it's very intense and very dark. There's a lot of really heavy stuff that happens. Um, what is happening to my, my ring light? We've been fine for a while, but all of a sudden it's doing weird things again. So if the lighting looks funny, the haunted ring light is back. The, my, go, my ghost and my ring light is <laughs> it's apparently back for those of you who are here when this was happening a few months ago. I don't know. Um, yeah, this is the thing is it kind of presents itself as being this rom-com and it's really not. It's very heavy. It starts off with our hero losing his wife in a car accident because he's choosing to drive drunk against her protestations. Like that's how the book starts. And it like, there, there's a lot. There's a lot of stuff. I'm not going to talk too much about it here. I wrote a pretty in-depth review on Goodreads and my Goodreads account is always linked down below. So if you want more details on this or if you want to know some of the content warnings, I would check that out. The highlight of this for me was definitely the son. The autistic son was lovely. I really liked him, but I got really frustrated with the relationship between the hero and heroine. I felt like they had so many unresolved problems and they were so bad at communicating with each other and they had a lot of physical chemistry but they couldn't communicate and I'm like sex does not solve problems like the fact that you like sleeping together is not fixing that problem you just had and like I don't know so I struggled with this I ended up giving it two stars 
But again, you know, everybody wants different things from their romance. I also gave two stars to Some Far Away Place by Lauren Shippen. This is book three in the Bright Sessions series. I had read the first book a few years ago and I really loved it. I never read book two, but I was under the impression through the marketing campaigns that these could be read as standalones. I'm gonna tell you, they can't really be read as standalones, unfortunately. Like each book does follow a different character, but there's a lot of material that ends up linking to other stories more than I was expecting. Aside from just that though, that wasn't my issue with it. The thing with this book was it had way too much going on. It had so many different plot lines and all of them were things where I was like, okay, there's something that I want to like here. There's some good ideas ideas here, but they never gelled together. They never got fully developed in a way that was satisfying. And I found most of the book to be really frustrating. I got to the end of it and I was like, okay, like what was the point of everything I just read? Like there's bits and pieces of things you're trying to do, but it's not coming together and it's not being fully addressed in a satisfying way. So like the, the premise of the series, right, is that there is a woman who is a therapist who works with kids with like supernatural abilities, basically, like superhero type abilities. And the main character in this book is a young woman who comes from a family where her parents and her siblings all have these abilities and she doesn't. She wants to be a chef. She's got a job. She's got a new girlfriend she's excited about. And then she starts discovering that she can go into other people's dreams and that like creates some issues. So the thing is, is that this book is has a romance, but the romance is like there and then not there while it's doing other stuff and then there again, like it's very back and forth. So it's it's got a romance. It's got a fraught sibling relationship. It's got um, family challenges with related to somebody having a medical issue. It's got stuff with her dream diving ability that ends up being used as a stand in for talking about like addiction and depression. Then there's this whole other subplot with like a mystery type thing and a character who's been part of other books. And this is where like you kind of need to have read the other books to totally understand what's going on. There's some other stuff too. It's a lot. It's too much. <laughs> and I just felt like it didn't come together. It was something where I was like, okay, I see what you're trying to do here. I like what you're trying to do, but the execution just really wasn't there for me. And so unfortunately, I gave this one two stars. Then I read a book that was honestly a huge disappointment. This is probably among the most disappointing books of the year because I was super anticipating this. On paper, it had so much going for it and seemed like it should be right up my alley, but I ha had some real issues with it. This is Son of the Storm by Sui Davies Okungboa. I am so bummed about this. I think the cover is stunning and I was like, yes, this sounds really cool. The start of a new West African inspired fantasy with like strong female characters and politics. Like, yeah, this sounds so up my alley. Um, and it just did not, did not live up to my hopes and expectations, unfortunately. So one part of this is that while in theory I like a lot of the ideas with the politics and like the main plot points that it's trying to do, in practice the writing itself I found to be pretty dry and info dumpy. I had kind of a hard time getting through this and I had the audiobook that didn't super help. And it wasn't just the beginning of the book either. I was hoping, okay, maybe it's just going to be the beginning of the book where it does this. But no, it kind of kept doing it. There was just so much exposition. And the characters, again, seemed interesting on paper, but often felt like they were kept at an arm's length where you couldn't really quite connect with them or root for them in a lot of cases to the degree that you might want to. And then I also have some real questions and feelings about our main female perspective character from this. I want to talk about this here, but I'm going to tell you it's a little bit spoilery. So if you don't want any spoilers for Son of the Storm, you might want to skip ahead to the next book. <laughs> so our main female perspective character I think is intended to be viewed as a villain. And while I, I love a good female villain, my issue with this is it felt like a lot of her characterization was rooted in misogyny. So I'm going to read a little bit to you from my review on Goodreads for this part of it because I don't want to get things wrong and also 
I don't want to misspeak what I intend to say about it. So it's possible that maybe I'm wrong about how the author intends for us to read her, but one of the first things that we see this character do is have this no strings attached sexual encounter with her hairdresser when she is betrothed to somebody else, which you know, like at first I was like, oh, that's interesting. Like maybe we're trying to be sex positive here, but I'll just note that she's <laughs> the only character has a couple of instances like this. And she's like the only character who has this kind of explicit sexual encounter. And I, based on things that happen later, I don't think it's intended to be read as like a sex positive thing. I think it's intended to be read as like, oh, how villainous she's cheating on her betrothed. Because Spoilers, that encounter with her hairdresser ends up leading to a pregnancy where she basically ends up using her unborn biracial child as a source of magic that ultimately drains the life from that child. It is honestly pretty horrific and could be read as a sort of intense vilification of women who choose to end pregnancies. I don't know that that's how it's supposed to be read, but it's kind of how it comes across. So I say in my review that plus the fact that this clearly villainous woman pointedly has sex with more than one person in semi-graphic scenes while our hero does not reads a sexist. So I don't, I don't know, like maybe I'm missing something here. Maybe the author didn't intend any of that to be read that way but I just kind of want you to be aware if you pick this up what you're getting into. I was both deeply uncomfortable with the way that things were handled in terms of the characterization of that character and simultaneously bored by the dry and exposition heavy writing. So yeah, this was definitely a disappointment. I was really looking forward to it. I love the concept behind it. Um, but sadly, in execution, this really just didn't work for me. Oh, okay, <laughs> moving on to my two and a half star reads this month, there was one of them. This is What the Hex by Alexis Daria. This is another one of those audible original novellas, like a little romance novella. I sometimes like these as like a palate cleanser in between other books, which is how I used it. And honestly, this just wasn't my favorite of them. It sounded like something that would be fun and cute. It's about a witch returning home for a wedding and kind of getting back together with her ex and family drama and like danger and stuff. I don't know, like the plot I never fully bought. I didn't super care for their relationship with each other. Like it was it was okay. Like if you're just looking for something brief to like fill in, give you like a romance for a couple hours, it's okay. I gave it two and a half, rounded it up to three on Goodreads. This wasn't like terrible by any means, but it, you know, eh, it was it was okay. This month I gave one book three stars and I did talk about it in my mid month wrap up. That book is The Plentiful Darkness by Heather Kastner. If you want to hear about that, check out my mid month wrap up. I gave two books three and a half stars and one of them I talked about in my mid month wrap up. That book was Beasts of Prey by Ayana Gray. Uh, if you want to hear more thoughts on that again, check out the mid month wrap up. I also gave three and a half stars to The Witness for the Dead by Catherine Addison. This is a short novel set in the world of the Goblin Emperor and following one of the side characters in that book, the guy who's the witness for the dead. So this is interesting. It's a very different book from The Goblin Emperor and so I feel like it's going to appeal to a different audience. This one is from the perspective of this witness for the dead who is essentially working as a detective to solve these kind of cases so that he can do his job and like witness for these people who've who've died. He's able to like bring back recently dead spirits to talk to them briefly to find things out. So one of the cases in this is there was a goblin woman whose body was found dumped in the river and she was clearly murdered and he needs to figure out who she is and who killed her. That's one of the primary cases. There are some others as well. I liked this pretty well. I definitely enjoyed it but I do think there were too many plots and side plots and it caused the book to sometimes lose momentum because he would get off for, you know, lengthy periods of time on some other side quest or request or political thing he's having to deal with. And while all of them individually are interesting, I just feel like, especially for a novel this short, it's just over 200 pages, it should have been a little bit more focused, maybe do like two or three 
cases that somehow tie together or whatever, maybe two, and then make it a series and do more books. I just feel like it was trying to pack too much plot into not enough space, but I still had a pretty good time with it. I liked the main character. I think the writing is really nice. And I thought that the stories and the cases were pretty interesting. So I gave this three and a half stars and rounded it up to four on Goodreads. Moving on, let's talk about my four star reads. This month there were nine of them and three of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap up. Those books were The Red Umber Forest by Kimberly Grimes, Under the Whispering Door by TJ Klune, and Witch Please by Anna Guire. If you want to hear more thoughts on those books, check out my mid-month wrap-up. I also gave four stars to Magic Strikes by Alona Andrews. I read this for a video project I'm working on, so I'm not really going to talk too much about it here. At, at some point, I will hopefully finish that video project and actually get it up, but this is the third book in the Kate Daniel series and I gave it four stars. I also gave four stars to My Monticello by Jocelyn Nicole Johnson. This I had as an audio review copy from NetGalley and it was really interesting. It's a debut collection of short stories plus a novella. The novella is titled My Monticello, which is also the title of the collection. And I think it's a really interesting collection of stories that are exploring the Black experience in America from a variety of perspectives. I think it's a really strong debut collection and apparently the novella part of it, My Monticello, I think ended up getting a deal with Netflix where it's going to be adapted and I can see why. I think it would make a fascinating adaptation. I'm not going to talk here too much about the short stories. If you want to hear about those, I address them a little bit in my Goodreads review, but the novella My Monticello is really interesting. It takes place where there's been kind of social upheaval and breakdown and a group of people flee to take shelter at the estate of Monticello, which is where Thomas Jefferson lived. Um, if you don't know much about Thomas Jefferson, he was an early American U.S. president. He spoke out against slavery, but also owned a lot of slaves and had several children with his teenage mistress, Sally Hemming. I think he was like 40 something and she was 14 years old when they first started sleeping together. And so what's interesting about this is it's not a historical novel, but the main character is a young woman who is a descendant of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, who is among this group of people who flee to take shelter in Monticello. And it's it's really interesting. It's like exploring these issues of identity and the past and uh, finding your place in the world and like navigating the messiness of power dynamics and race when you've got that kind of stuff playing into it. It's, it's very interesting. So I'm super curious to see what Netflix ends up doing with it. Not a perfect collection, but really strong for a debut. And I gave this four stars. I also gave four stars to The Keeper of Night by Kylie Lee Baker. This was another audio review copy that I had from NetGalley. And I also am reading it kind of for another video. But since it's something I have for review, I'm going to talk about it here as well. It's a YA fantasy debut following a young woman who is half British Reaper, half Japanese Shinigami, which is kind of the, I guess, the like the Japanese equivalent to the, the Reaper who like reaps souls of the dead. So she has been raised in historical London, has been reaping souls for like 100 years, but deals with a lot of race related discrimination and bullying from people. When something bad happens, she and her half brother flee to Japan where she wants to track down her Japanese Shinigami mother who she believes abandoned her as a baby. Really interesting. It kind of blends fantasy and horror. It draws a lot on Japanese folklore and mythology and it is dark. Like I did not realize a lot of this Japanese mythology was so like dark and violent and bloody. Like this is definitely on the dark and violent side for a YA book, but at its heart, it's really a book about the experience of being a biracial person and feeling like you don't really fit, feeling like you're seen as less than from both sides of your heritage and having to struggle with that and figure out like, where is your family and, and like, what are you willing to do to try to fit in? It's kind of heartbreaking and there's this like, like brother sister relationship at the core of it. So yeah, I think it's really good. It's got a lot going for it. There are definitely some moments and tropes where I'm like, okay, this feels like very what much what you would expect from a YA fantasy. And so those moments I was like, yeah, okay. But I think what really pulls it through is the thematic content of dealing with this like biracial identity 
combined with this bringing to life of Japanese mythology, which I think is really, really cool. The author herself is biracial, white, and Japanese. And yeah, I gave it four stars. I think it's one that a lot of people would enjoy and it's worth checking out if that sounds of interest. I also gave four stars to The Martian by Andy Weir. And this book I actually talk about in a video I did where I had celebrities choose books for me in personalized videos. One of one of a couple of videos I've done recently that I'm very excited about. So I'm going to link that up above if you want to check it out. And I'm not going to say too much about it here, but I did enjoy this. And I'm glad that I finally read the book and I gave it four stars. The final book that I gave four stars to was Voice of War by Zach Argyle. This was an audio review copy sent to me by an indie author. I think it's a really interesting book. It's very strong for early on in an indie career. It's a multi POV fantasy novel set in a world where eye color is how you tell what kind of magic somebody has and people are used to there only being two different kinds of magic like pushing magic and pulling magic and so those relate to like blue and green eyes but there's a prophecy about these two other kinds of magic with different colored eyes and uh, there's a baby who has those colored eyes the parents need to try to keep the baby alive there's also non-magical people who are like kidnapping magic users and draining them of their blood so that people can drink it to experience the magic there's like a lot of stuff going on it's very interesting it definitely kept my attention and I was into a lot of the characters there are also some just really sweet moments between one of our main male characters and his wife, themes about like family. It's got a bunch of strong female characters who are really interesting and fully fleshed out, which is great to see with a guy writing fantasy that is not something you always see. So I was definitely impressed with that. I think he did a good job of really fleshing out these characters that are quite different from each other. And there's like character arcs. I'm curious to see what's going to happen in book two, given where we ended. The audiobook is phenomenal. Like the narration is really, really good. I love the person who did the narration. His voice was fantastic. And that definitely, I think, heightened the experience for me. The one issue that I had with this, and I talk about this in my Goodreads review, and in fact, because I knew going in this was going to be an issue, I had emailed, um, before I accepted it, I emailed the author about it and was like, hey, just so you know, I'm seeing in some of these reviews that there is some like fat phobia happening and with regards to one of the characters and if that's the case that's something I would talk about in a review and he kind of came back and was like yeah you're right that is there one of the POVs and I'll say in this book it's a more minor POV is a young very immature young man where there's a guy who is both fat and evil who kind of like a job of the hut character almost but human who had killed his parents and he uses a lot of fat phobic language so sent a and he also sent a snippet from book two where the way that he talks about that character is challenged in like on the page in book two by another character kind of challenging him on on that um so i appreciated that he was aware of it and that he was doing something to kind of address it to me it did still feel a little bit excessive i think that if you're very sensitive to fat phobic language it could be an issue for you. For me, I think I knew going in it was going to be there. The parts of the book that included that were relatively minor compared to the rest of the story. And so it wasn't like a deal breaker for me. But I just want to make sure that you're aware that that's something that is in there. Otherwise, I really liked this pretty well. And I gave it four stars. Next, let's talk about my four and a half star reads. This month, there were four of them. And two of them I talked about in my mid month wrap up. Those books are My Heart is a Chainsaw by Stephen Graham Jones and The Hollow Heart by Marie Rikoski. Check out my mid-month wrap-up if you want to hear more about those. I also gave four and a half stars to The Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler. This was the Patreon book club pick for this month and I liked it. I've pretty much loved everything from Octavia Butler and I want to eventually read everything that she's written. I'm very anxious to read book two in the series because I'm super curious to see what's going to happen. One thing that I didn't know going in is this is an epistolary novel. It's written as a series of diary entries and what's wild about this book is that even though it was written in the early 90s, the beginning of the book starts in 2024, which is not that far from where we are. And so that's a little bit trippy. 
And, you know, while the world that we live in is not as severe as what you see take place here, it doesn't seem that wild and out there as maybe it would have. It follows a young girl who is the daughter of a Baptist minister, and they're living in a time where the structure of society has really broken down. There's very little government. Um, corporations are starting to have more control over certain areas, and she lives in a gated community where everybody is armed to try to keep people out. And there's a lot of poverty. There's a lot of a, lo a lot of things. And it follows this young woman who is in the process of developing her own religion, basically. Like she goes through all of this stuff. It's following like her journey of like growing up and eventually having to flee her community. And like, I won't get into everything that happens a lot, like all the content warnings, like it's dark and violent, it's intense, but it's interesting. She creates kind of this religion or these ideas where her God is change. And Octavia Butler like, really dives into like, okay, if you worship change as like your deity, what would that mean for different parts of life? And anyway, it was great. It was really interesting. And this is part of the Earthseed duology. And Earthseed is the name of the religion. The idea being basically that people are the seed of Earth that are meant to go and be scattered among the stars and like multiply and develop. And if you're familiar with the, the Christian Bible, the parable of the sower, the title of this parable of the sower is based on this parable Jesus told about this man who scatters seed on different types of ground. And so there's hard rocky ground where the seed just stays on the top and it doesn't grow. There's ground where it gets like choked out by weeds. And then there's like good fertile soil where the like the seed grows and flourishes. And I think it's meant to kind of mirror her ideas about some of the ideas that humanity is similar to that, that there it won't be all of humanity who wants to join these communities that she has in her head to create, but that some of them might. And like, I don't know, it's it's really interesting. Um, a lot of interesting ideas. I liked it a lot. I like Octavia Butler, and I'm excited to read more. I also gave four and a half stars to The Girls Are Never Gone by Sarah Glenn Marsh. I had an e-arc of this from NetGalley, and I love Sarah Glenn Marsh. This book is no different. If you were looking for a spooky haunted house story with ghosts, this is a great one. Our heroine is a bisexual teen girl with type 1 diabetes who also runs a paranormal investigation podcast, and she is spending the summer helping to renovate this old house that is supposedly haunted, where a teen girl had died in the lake, and uh, she's there to investigate. She has never seen a real ghost. She's not sure they exist, and often her work is about more disproving the these stories, but she would love to be proven wrong, and this might be the summer for meeting ghosts and also maybe meeting a cute girl. And it's it's good. It definitely has, it definitely goes there in terms of the like spooky ghost horror stuff. It's got tons of those vibes. I thought this was great. I also don't think you see type 1 diabetes in books very often, and that was cool. The author herself has type 1 diabetes, and it's clear that she put a lot of her own experience into the experience of the character. And that is something she lives with, and it's something that is really woven into the story. And even in some cases, is used to like heighten the tension of something that's going on. So I thought that was done really, really well. And yeah, I really like this. Gave it four and a half stars. Go check it out. It's great for spooky season. Moving on, let's talk about my five star reads. This month there were eight of them. Two of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap up. And then two of them I talk about in that celebrities pick my TBR video. So I'm not going to get deeply into those here either. The books that I talked about in my mid-month wrap up are Sorrowland by River Solomon and Redemptor by Jordan E. Fuego. So if you want to hear about those, check out my mid-month wrap-up. And then in the Celebrities Pick My TBR video, I read The Road by Cormac McCarthy. I gave this one five stars. And The Collapsing Empire by John Scalzi. This was maybe my favorite thing that I read for that video. I loved it. I had so much fun with it, and I've since gone out and bought the entire trilogy. So thank you, James Marsters, aka Spike, for your wonderful sci-fi book recommendation. I also gave five stars on a reread to Dune by Frank Herbert. Look, I am not the most unbiased reviewer of this. This book is not perfect. It is in some ways a product of its time, but I also think that there are some misconceptions people reading it today have about what it's intended to do, especially if you stop 
with Dune and don't read on to Dune Messiah. So yeah, anyway, I have a lot of nostalgia for this book as well. I really love it. I, like, and I know it's not a perfect book and there are definitely some things that do not hold up to today, but it's still a five star read for me. It's one of my favorite books. And uh, if you want to hear more in depth thoughts about this, myself and my friend and new co host of Chapter 3 podcast are going to be doing an episode talking about Dune along with Alex Nieves after the new Dune movie comes out. So we're going to be talking about Dune, we're going to also have seen the movie, and we're going to do like a book versus movie and a more in-depth conversation about this. So if you want to check it out, um, Chapter 3 Podcast is always linked down below. And yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to talk about it. I I'm also really glad I reread it. It had been like 10 years since the last time I read this. And if you want to hear more thoughts before that podcast episode, because it's going to be a while, I do have a review on Goodreads where I get a little bit more into it. So you can check that out there. But I'm still a fan. Another book that was five stars upon reread was, of course, The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemisin. We do have a live show for this where we talk about it in depth. So I will link that up above. This is one of my top 10 most favorite books of all time. So am I shocked I still gave it five stars? <laughs> no, I think N.K. Jemisin is a genius and I love everything by her. But this is maybe my favorite book from her so far. Uh, yeah, I love it. It was great to reread it. If you want to hear more thoughts, check out the live show. Then for another spooky ghost story, I also gave five stars to Summer Suns by Lee Mandello. Had to change the battery there, so if things look slightly different, that's why. But Summer Suns, I had an audio review copy from NetGalley. This was fantastic. I'm gonna read you the first sentence from my Goodreads review. Southern Gothic horror meets dark academia in this intricately woven narrative of grief, facing your past, uncovering the truth, and coming to terms with who you really are. Also, this book is super queer, and I loved it. Like, it really grew on me and got under my skin. When I first started it, I was like, oh, this is cool. This is kind of interesting. But by the end of it, I was like, oh, this is so good. This is so so good. It follows a guy who is moving to Nashville after his best friend has died to kind of pick up the pieces, start graduate school, and secretly investigate what he thinks is a murder. Supposedly, the friend died through suicide, but he is convinced that is not the case. Meanwhile, he also has a dark secret and something may be haunting him. And uh, this book is so interesting. It deals with toxic masculinity and homophobia. It deals with racism in the South and in institutions of higher learning in really interesting ways. There's a side character who is the only Black student in a graduate program, and it shows you some of the microaggressions and discrimination he faces, which is very real. And it, you know, it's a slow burn. Dark academia meets Southern Gothic horror. It's kind of a ghost story. It's creepy. It's great. I loved it. I gave it five stars. Definitely would recommend. And the final book that I gave five stars to in the month of September was The Love Hypothesis by Allie Hazelwood. This has been getting a lot of buzz, understandably. I originally heard about this from my friend Mara over at Books Like Whoa because this is her favorite romance of the year. Then it made Book of the Month Club. I started seeing people on TikTok talking about it and I was like, well, clearly I need to get it. And then I needed some romance. I listened to it near the end of the month, like pretty soon after I got it. And it's fantastic. I did have an audio review copy from the Penguin Random House Volumes app, so thank you to them. And I had my Book of the Month Club thing. This is one where I'm like, I'm not sure it's quite a six star read for me, but it's definitely up there. And I would expect to see this on my list of best romances of the year as well. It's this mix of brainy and nerdy with like a slow burn, steamy romance. The heroine is a demisexual grad student in the sciences, and the hero is a a professor in the science sciences, but he doesn't work with her. So they're technically in the same large department at Stanford, but he doesn't work with her or oversee her or anything. It's got a fake dating relationship that leads to a real relationship. And I, it, the word demisexual is not used on the page here, but it's very clear that's the intent. She talks about how she's never really been sexually attracted to very many people because she needs to have a close emotional bond before she experiences that. And 
it's great. I think it's really good. You also get kind of a grumpy sunshine thing. He's kind of grumpy and she's very bubbly. And I do think it's interesting that this was originally based on Raylo fanfic. So if you're familiar with in Star Wars, uh, you know, people who ship Kylo Ren with Rey. Um, this, this is kind of giving you that. One thing I love about this is I finished it and I was like, okay, I need to look up the author bio because I am pretty sure that she actually has been through being a woman in the sciences in grad school. And sure enough, I was correct because she deals with a lot of stuff that is all too real for women in STEM. And she also touches through a side character on the particular issues BIPOC women in STEM deal with specifically Black, Indigenous, and women of color. But it's really interesting because she faces things like sexual harassment, people trying to steal her work, people not expecting as much of her because she's female or not giving her the same opportunities. And all of those things are very real in the sciences for women. So I thought this was great. It was a nice blend of dealing with real life issues and having this great slow burn romance that I really loved. And by the end, I was really rooting for them to be together. So yeah, I thought this was fantastic. I think a lot of people are really gonna love it. Lastly in September I had two books that I gave six stars and I did talk about both of them in my mid-month wrap-up. Those books were The Inheritance of Orchidea Divina by Zoraida Cordova. I really loved this one. And The Fellowship of the Ring by J.R.R. Tolkien. And we have a whole live show dedicated to talking about this. This was technically a reread for me, but I hadn't read it since I was a teenager and so I broke my own rules to give it six stars because I adored it more than I even expected to this time. Absolutely loved it. Those are all the books that I read in the month of September. We had some ups and downs, but also had some really great books come out of this month. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on any of the books that I talked about in this video. And for question of the day, all right, this isn't the most uplifting, but let's talk about disappointments. Because I do feel like this is a real thing that happens sometimes is that we have high hopes and high expectations for something and then are a little bit disappointed by it in practice. I think the big one for me this month was Son of the Storm. This was a big disappointment for me where I expected so much and it just really didn't live up to it. So is there a book this year for you that has been like that where you had really high hopes for it, but sadly it just, ah, didn't, didn't quite work for you the way you hoped it would. Leave it in the comments down below. If you like this video, it really helps if you give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you wanna see more. Thank you all so much for watching and I will see you next time.